everybody. Welcome to AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. Aubrey Edwards here with my wonderful, beautiful friend, Tony Schiavone. How are you doing this morning, Tony? I'm doing great, Aubrey. What's going on with you? It's kind of cold over here in Seattle. I got used to Florida the last time we were there. I got used to Texas. This is a weird time of year. There's allergies, weird mm-hmm. weather. I don't like it. You know who well, I do like, though? You know what I do like? Uh, I do like that we finally have Brody King on the roster, who who I've known for, for a little bit. And I'm I'm so happy he's here. I heard you had a birthday very recently at, at the time of this recording. So happy birthday. Happy birthday, man. How are you? Thank you. Hello. How are you guys? Doing You're okay. Doing, doing okay. Doing great. I worked with Brody and MLW for a little bit. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah. That was, uh, as they say, a cup of coffee. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's great to have you in AEW. I know well, there's a lot of people backstage excited about seeing you here because they've worked with you um, on on many circuits. And uh, how, uh, Brody, how did you uh, get approached about coming to AEW? Uh, it was it was just kind of weird like i feel like uh like you said a lot of people that were probably excited for me to be there were also maybe campaigning for me to come there right you know guys like uh mjf and and darby and you know there's a whole list of people that i i used to you know work with on the indies and like we right. all kind of came up came up together so they always kind of were like they would check in every couple months be like hey when when is your contract up when are you coming here or whatever um and then obviously with the fallout of Ring of Honor, uh, you know, the gear started turning a little bit more. And then sure. uh, I got into contact with Tony, I think maybe the day after um, the news of Ring of Honor broke. So right. it, it kind of it, hap- it happened quite rapidly. But I would say that the wheels really started turning when um, Malachi, <clears throat> uh, Tommy, got released from WWE. And we kind of like started putting this whole House of Black, Kings of the Black Throne thing together. Right. Yeah, because you guys uh, already tagged together on the indies. You're the PWG ch- uh, tag champions, which congratulations, by the way. It's kind of yeah. crazy. Like for those that pay attention, it was like, oh, this is inevitable because the two are already a faction elsewhere. Like, let's just get the guy here. They both have a billion tattoos. Like, this totally works. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it, love it. It, it was cool. Like, you know, Tommy was like, well, let's just see, like, if we like mesh well together in the ring, like just kind of like get some reps in and see where this goes. And hopefully, you know, it'll take off from there. And and I think it has. So when he hit it, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. ahead. Okay. So when you go ahead, I'm gone. So when Malachi hinted, uh, uh, your arrival in December in a vignette, in other words, house of black, getting more members, uh, was it already known that he was talking about you or. Yeah. Okay. I mean, he mentions. Now you're I mean, it was, no, it was known to me. I don't know about if it was known to everybody else. But. No, okay. <laughs> right. Because, you know, we had, mean, we, had, we had seen you backstage. You know, we had seen you backstage a couple of times uh, early before this. You and I had talked, and I said, oh, hey, Brody's here, and maybe uh, it can uh, turn into something. I didn't know if, you know, if you how early you knew or, you know. Uh, so it was around Thanksgiving that we kind of like – it was uh, – a. Um, full gear that we kind of you know made a handshake on it and then everything started proceeding in like december but uh yeah it was it was funny because i would be like i would show up backstage and everyone would be like are you doing something tonight i'm like no like are you signed yet i'm like no not yet like (laughs) so it's just like you know the inevitable weight of uh putting pen to paper right i'm uh i'm not gonna name names but it's kind of one of those like Everyone in wrestling is friends with each other, so you occasionally see like people come backstage that aren't signed, and it's like, "Hey, man, what's going on?" And then the general question of like, "Are you signed yet?" always happens yeah. because it's just like <laughs> this is inevitable. You're all buddies yeah. with everybody. Nepotism one runs wild. It's great. Um, <laughs> so I love uh, love the dark, creepy vignettes. It's it's so great. It's really unlike anything else we have on the show right now. Uh, what's it like to film those with Malachi? Do you guys uh, all meet up together? Do you, what's the creative process? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Malachi has a very specific vision in mind for the House of Black, but you know it, it fits very much into like what my aesthetic and like you know beliefs and everything else are. So it's when it comes to usually he'll have an idea and then he'll bring it 
bring it up to Buddy and I, and then we just kind of riff off of that. And I think it's funny because I think this is very different for Buddy. Like he's not used to the, you know, darker end of things or like, you know, the the religious cues that we have in our stuff and like the tattoos, obviously. So kind of teaching him like, you know, he, he'll come to us and be like, oh, what do you think about this? And we're like, well, you know, that's a little bit more slipknot. We're kind of going a little bit more like death death metal or black metal. So it's like, you know, we're, we're able to teach him along the way of, uh, you know, what we're going for and what like the, the roots of everything are coming from. Like uh, when we, right before Buddy debuted, uh, Malachi sent like pages and pages of like what references he gets for the House of Black. And it's all like, you know, like pagan religions and like creepy witchcraft stuff and all this stuff that you can pull from. And I, I guarantee like buddy's like, what the hell have I got myself into? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, and I was, uh, actually watching, uh, the entrance you guys made, uh, on, uh, recently on, on rampage. Uh, and that was in that, uh, trio match. That was, that, that is so creepy and so ominous. And the music, the Rise from Ruins music, uh, who found that song and uh, why is it? Why do you think it's perfect for House of Black? So there's like, it, it's funny because whenever we're doing like rehearsals for music, there's it's usually like, no, wrong song, wrong song. Because there's like five songs that are within the House of Black. Like we each have our own single song. Right. Uh, Tom and I have our own tag song with Kings of the Black Throne and then House of Black has its own song. So uh, Tom, his, uh, or Malachi, his entrance is uh, um, the band Amon Ra. And it's, I don't even know how to pronounce the name of the song, but <laughs> it's, it's like a, a heavy, like doom band. Uh, and he became friends with those guys. And they have another band uh, called Absence in Body. Right. Which uh, is the House of Black theme. And right. that that song actually it wasn't even released yet when we he was friends with um, the person that runs the record label that has that band on it. Um, also, members of the band include Scott Kelly, who is in a very famous doom hardcore band called Neurosis, who's actually from Seattle. Uh, yep. But uh I've been a big fan of Neurosis for a long time. Uh, I actually got linked up with Scott Kelly a few years ago because he's a big wrestling fan. So I think like the the marriage of the two was was really cool. Like he got to be part of wrestling. We got to do something with you know these legendary members of of a band that I've loved forever. Um, and yeah, it just kind of all came together. And they, they their record isn't even out yet. So for them to allow us to kind of like debut the song on um, revolution. And then they put it out. I think the following Thursday was really awesome because, you know, that's, that's a, a big moment for a band. Damn. That's, I had no idea that they hadn't released the song yet. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I love just the crossover with wrestling and music, like how Ruby Soho and, and her whole relationship with Lars, like it's, it's, it's so great to hear like, and, and I mean, Butcher, him being like in a band, um, yeah. it, it's just absolutely incredible to hear these stories of like, oh, yeah, I know this guy. I know this guy. And it's like, oh, this is my friend's song or this is my song. or whatever. Like, it's it's well, wild. It's funny, too, because like, you know, some of these bands, like I, I guarantee a lot of people on the roster loved Rancid growing up. Like that was right. like one of my formidable bands that got me into punk rock. So it's like seeing Lars backstage now, I was like, Oh wow. Like I've, I've met him a few times and like, we've talked and stuff. And it's, it's just weird that, you know, you're conversing with someone that you like looked up to so, so heavily in your youth. And I feel like the same is probably the, it's probably the same for someone like Ruby who now, you know, he's walking her to the ring, like with his music playing. So you, you mentioned a little bit and obviously buddy Matthews joined you guys after the fact, uh, you and Malachi had kind of already linked up on TV. Uh, uh, so first off, when did you guys find out that he was coming along into AEW? And secondly, have you talked to him about needing a lot of tattoos? Because there's very clearly a visual <laughs> difference between him and the rest of members of the House of Black. Uh, 
so I think the the plan was always me, Buddy, and and Malachi. So you know, we kind of unofficially had uh, our own like dream scenario that ended up working out perfectly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like it's kind of cool that he has like no tattoos and like that he's just different because I mean he is unbelievably jacked like i've never seen someone with like that much muscle definition as him uh so i think you know he has his own like unique look within the within the house because i don't think there's maybe i don't know maybe pack but like there's not very many people that look like buddy right yeah he's he's spectacular he he really is his look it's so and yours too. I mean, the the entire House of Black has this very unique look, not only as together but individually, and that's one of the things that I think kind of makes it work. Now, you started training uh, Brody in 2014. We're going to talk about your previous career a little bit later. What inspired you to completely change paths and get into pro wrestling? It was really all an accident. Um, I just kind of always wanted. I just do things that I'm interested in and, you know, see if I like it or not. Uh, You know, like I did like a Twitch thing or like if I want to try to skateboard, I'll go jump on a skateboard. But wrestling was always something I was interested in. I wouldn't say I was like the biggest fan ever, but I was more interested in how to do it than like watching it, I would say. And uh, when I found out like there, there was a wrestling school, one of my friends kind of met a wrestler he took a couple bumps and ran the ropes. And I was like, okay, how, how do I do this? And we went to a, a local indie show uh, at their school. And I signed up for wrestling school the next day. And at first it was just kind of like, well, this is a good way, you know, to get in shape, like to get some good cardio and stuff in. And then it just like, you know, became like an addiction. Like I just started watching wrestling. I started watching, watching, you know, Japanese wrestling. And it was like, okay. This is this is what I want to do. Uh, so the, you fall into wrestling accidentally, but you know you you have the name Brody, which at AEW is a very very important name. And I want to talk a little bit about where the inspiration for the name Brody comes from. So I mean, obviously Bruiser Brody, like that was like one of the first people that you know was I was told to watch because obviously I have a similar look, like. It's funny because when I started wrestling training, I didn't have a beard. I never grew a beard. I didn't even know I could grow a beard. And like um, what my wrestling trainer was like, can you grow a beard? I was like, uh, I don't know. He goes, well, you should probably try because your ma- your face doesn't match the rest of your body. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Because uh, I have, a, I guess, a very young baby face without this. Uh, yeah. So I, when I started growing my beard, I started growing my hair. It was like, like, okay, you need to watch guys, you know, like Bruiser Brody, Terry Gordy, Stan Hansen, like these big hosses from Japan. Like, you're going to see a different way of a big man wrestling than you ever saw on like WWF or WWE, you know. Um, and that's what really hooked me into wrestling. So I think Brody, like, I was back and forth on a bunch of stupid names. And then um, I think Tyler Bateman was like, you should, you should try Brody. And like, I had been watching uh Brody Lee's independent stuff you know his like as far as big men wrestling Luke Harper was huge and like me seeing somebody on TV doing these things that most other big men weren't doing like he was doing hurricanes and he was doing dives and like all this other crazy stuff and then you know I started watching his Chikara stuff and like watching it was even more there you know he was like able to be an incredible base, but also do like these incredible things as a big man. So, you know, he was in the WWE and I was like, well, seems like Brody works on, on multiple levels. So then I became Brody King. We are talking with Brody King on AEW unrestricted before he got into wrestling. uh, He had a very uh, successful career in Hollywood. We're (laughs) talking about some of the series that he worked on. And before we do that, We'll take this break. AEW Unrestricted continues. Tony and Aubrey talking with Brody King. Uh, You had a great gig in Hollywood uh, before you started in wrestling. Tell us about that. I I know there's a lot to talk about, but tell us what your basically your job was in Hollywood. 
Uh, so I was a union set lighting technician uh, for movies and TV. Right. Uh, my dad did it for 30 plus years. My grandfather did it for 60 plus years. So it was kind of like a, you know, family business, I guess. But, uh, you know, as a kid that was, you know, not very in, in love with school, um, I tried community college for a couple months. And I just when I realized I didn't have to go, I just didn't go. Right. So my dad was like, well, you want a job? And I was like, sure. And then, you know, I got my days um, in the union and I started working when I was 18, which was very much a curse and a blessing. Uh, I feel like it, it's very similar to, to wrestling where, you know, you have the guys that have been doing this for a long time that tr- re- treat it respectfully. And, and they, you know, this is their way of living and this is the way they make money. And when you have a, you know, a shithead kid coming in at 18 and giving you attitude and telling you how it is, you know, they get, they're making adult money, but they don't want to, they want to take days off and all this and that, you know, it rubs you the wrong way. So I, I burned a lot of bridges when I was uh, between 18 and probably 22. And then, you know, I moved out and I had a girlfriend and it's like, wow, I, I got to pay bills. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm living off like the, the dollar menu at Burger King. It's like, yeah. I got to, I got to figure this out. Uh, so, you know, I started mending those relationships and uh, I would say by the time I was like, 25 26 i had, i was in a pretty successful spot with uh set lighting um working on movies like pirates of the caribbean and like marvel movies and you know reality tv shows like big brother i was actually working on the season that uh luchasaurus was on so that was pretty funny um small world but yeah yeah it, it is a it is a small world but yeah it was a it was a good job it, it's like it's a great career. It's like hard work. It's, you know, basically construction. You're just picking up heavy stuff and moving it around and putting it down, but you get to experience a lot of cool things. You know, like I worked on the movie angels and demons and we built the Trevi fountain in the parking lot of the forum. And it's like you on the outside, you just see like the facade walls, but then you walk inside and you're you're like in the middle of Vatican square, which is, insane right. but uh so there's a lot of uh, cool things that i got to experience doing stuff like that but i just i was never really in love with it it wasn't the creative outlet i needed so i think that's where wrestling fulfilled a lot of that you also worked on rupaul's drag race yeah uh so i did uh probably five years on rupaul's drag race um i think season seven through 11 or 12 or something like that but yeah that, that was that was one of my favorites to work on uh at first it, it wasn't because the it was more low budget so the rate was lower so i wasn't getting paid as much but it was always like fun to go to work and like you know you get a whole new respect for like a different art form and especially like when i was wrestling training you saw so much similarities between the two worlds and like, there's so much, you know, pageantry and competition and stuff like that. And yeah, uh, now I watch it all the time. And, you know, me and my, <laughs> me and my wife will go to, to drag bars and, you know, have dinner or whatever and watch the show. And so it's cool. How different is to work on a reality competition show compared to a movie or a scripted series? Uh, it's, it's really different. So you're more on the fly and like, you're constantly like, setting up new scenes like that are kind of come out of nowhere. Whereas like, you know, a hundred million dollar movie, they're going to be like, we're doing this on this day. And you're like, okay, you know exactly what's coming up. And there's a whole schedule for a month and a half. But on, on those, it's like, you know, it could be like, so-and-so is getting into a fight. We get, we need a whole setup like right now. And you're like, Oh shit. Okay. I got to right. hurry up, grab the light and, right. and set it all up. So it's kind of like pro wrestling, right? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it is, it is yeah. very much like pro wrestling. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Damn. On, on the fly. I get that, man. So you work, you've you worked on a lot of series, a lot of movies, various different stuff. Is is there any sort of like favorite experience you have or favorite actors you've worked with? Uh, I worked on Parks and Rec for a while. And guys like Chris Pratt and, and Nick Offerman were really cool. Like they would always just stand around the crew and joke around um 
Tom Hanks. I got to meet Tom Hanks once. That was cool. Uh, I, I think like maybe the the coolest and like the really the only time I ever got starstruck was uh, I was working on Sons of Anarchy and it was the season when Henry Rollins was on. Right. And for those who don't know, Henry Rollins is the singer of the legendary band Black Flag. And, you know, he was always kind of like a, a big hero of mine, I guess. Like I, right. I, I would say I based a lot of, you know, my like Brody King is probably part Henry Rollins, part like caveman part something else uh but he was like on set and like he was like talking to everybody and i was just like petrified and one of the guys was like go talk to him I'm like nope can't do it like it's a, it was just like just being around him was awesome but i was like can't can't talk to him uh how long did you wrestle and keep your hollywood production gig uh i mean i i officially I, I'm not even officially retired, but I, I oh, okay. officially honorably withdrew um, mm -hmm. earlier this year. So, like, I just, you know, if there's ever a case where I need to go back, I can go back. Okay. But uh, I, I hope that 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 day doesn't come. Sure. But uh, I stopped doing it uh, regularly uh, either late 2000, I think it was like mid 2019. Right. Uh, that's when I, like, kind of like started to, uh, take more wrestling and less Hollywood. Right. But uh, it, it was just a weird transition because it, it's like, I don't know. I was always just kind of taught that you just work hard and you keep working hard. And then, you know, that's just what you do. So it's like, one day you retire. That's yeah. It. It, and it's like, you know, I, I read, I was reading uh, Britt Baker's post today about how, you know, she, she doesn't have down days. She goes right back to the dentist's office and, Right. She's got cuts and bruises on her face while she's working on people's teeth. And it's like, I, I have a lot of respect for people like that when they just, they don't really have an off switch, you know, for better or worse, but it's like, they, they're always hustling. They're always working and trying to better themselves. And I feel like I'm very much the same way. It's like, when I come home, it's like, I don't get to just lay around on the couch and play video games. It's like, I'm in dad mode. I'm like trying to figure out other things to do. I'm working out. Like there's always something going on like it. I respect it. That's, yeah. that's really, really Absolutely. good. I mean, right. especially when you've built a career from all that hard work and that just kind of translates over to something new. It's awesome. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there was a YouTube documentary about you. Brody King came out in February, 2022. Uh, what inspired you to tell your story in that form? Uh, so one of my good friends uh, owns a gym in, in Florida in Gainesville called American Barbell Club. And he's, pretty respected within like the powerlifting community and like uh he's just like an all-around supporter and like good friend and when we were when the uncertainty of ring of honor was happening he was like how do like what can we do to like get you some buzz and like get like a good like profile on you i was like i, I don't know and we're like literally sitting at breakfast and he's like texting and then he goes okay i got uh dylan to come film a documentary on you in whatever it was i think it was july i was like wait what and he's like yeah it'll be good like i was like okay so it's like he just kind of like took it upon himself to to just make this happen which is you know sometimes you just need a, a good push and uh you know i met with dylan and we just kind of like we didn't even really know where to go with it it was just like let's just see what happens let's do the interviews and, and see where it goes and uh, I'm really happy with the final product. I think that it's a good representation of myself. And uh, it was cool to see, like, you know, people that were big parts of my story and, and friends that I loved, like, see their perspective on, on my journey. Because, you know, from 2015 to about 2017, when I was on the independence and training and stuff like that, I didn't see anybody. I barely saw my wife. It was like, my, my friends call it like the, the dark period where I just disappeared for two years. Uh, so it, it was, it was cool to, to see, you know, their thoughts on it and, and see like what their perspective was on, on my work ethic and, and drive to, to be successful in wrestling. When you say Dylan, is that the Dylan that we know that kind of helps us sometimes? No, he's, he's a different one. Okay. Yeah. He's a different one. He's a filmmaker. Uh, okay. he owns a company called crucible media. He's a, okay. 
he does really great stuff. He like shoots these like crazy, like he's done a few like Indian weddings that are just like these insane weddings. And like, uh, I think yeah. one was in Cancun, Mexico. And it's just like, there's elephants and like flowers. Yeah. It's like these like million dollar weddings. And it's insane to watch. You wrestled for six months with your jaw wired shut, right? Not six months. I wrestled for a month with my jaw wires. Okay. All right. Probably felt uh, like six months. Probably it felt <laughs> oh, like six months. Yeah. Yeah. It, so, so there, okay. I, I broke my jaw. Uh, this was like maybe a week after signing and debuting for Ring of Honor. Uh, I wrestled uh, Jake Atlas, who is now with us at AEW. Right. And me and him were training partners. Uh, good friends and then this was kind of like my um departure from independent wrestling and from my school i was the champion at our school and it was kind of like you know passing the torch to him and he gave me a spin kick to the mouth and i or i felt my tooth break like my back molar broke i was like oh that's not fun that like had some blood in my mouth finished the match uh went to like an emergency dentist at like 1 a.m. He and as he was pulling the tooth, he already knew that there was like a, a hairline fracture beneath it, but he was trying to be as gentle as possible. But apparently I have very strong teeth and bones or whatever. So when they pulled the tooth, the jaw fully broke. Uh Whoa. yeah. And so this was two days before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Um so the next day I had to get emergency surgery on my jaw. And that was maybe the worst night of my life because not only am I dealing with this tooth pain, but now my jaw's broken and I had what I can only describe as like a cartoon bandage on, like literally like the bow tie above my head, like holding right. my face together. Right. Uh, and it's like, you're trying to get as much sleep as possible, but it's like, as soon as you fall asleep, you move and your jaw shifts and you're like, Oh God, like you snap back awake. Um, so I had jaw surgery the next day. Uh, they wired my jaw shut. The doctor comes in. He's like, all right, uh, you can absolutely not get hit in the face for six months. Like, you can't wrestle. You can't do anything. This, mind you, this is right after I signed with Ring of Honor. And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> like, I think he left. And I just looked at my wife. I said, well, that's not happening. Uh, I have AAW on Friday, and I'm wrestling Darby on Saturday. So <laughs> this was like six days later. Um I'm wrestling a cage match with Sammy Callahan at AAW uh, because I just, you know, I don't know what it was. I, I just felt like I had to fulfill my commitments. And like, I was, I had so much momentum that I was like, I, if I think I can do it, I could probably do it. Uh, it was painful and it sucked. And I don't think I took into consideration, like how hard breathing would be when your mouth is closed. And like, on top of that, I, I used to have like longer hair and I think I took like one bump and I, breathed in and hair just went in my mouth and you can't open your mouth to get it out so i'm just like trying to like pry it all out and it was uh it was it was the worst but uh i got used to it and then i just you know kept going with it i remember i texted Del delirious who is the booker at ring of honor and i was like hey man uh i just want you to know i broke my jaw this weekend uh it's wired shut but i'm completely okay to do all the shows he's like what like are oh you serious God. and yeah my first like month at ring of honor was i had a my jaw wired shut mm. oh my god this is it's wild it's <laughs> it's wild but at the same time it's like that's totally makes sense for the indies and like when you're just I mean, trying like, to make an name for yourself the thing is is that you know you hear of all these stories of you know people's documentaries of saying like oh i wrestled with a broken leg or you know Bob Orton with the broken, broken arm and stuff like this. So it's like, you know, my, my wrestling coach, he always used to say pro wrestlers are tough. Like sometimes you just have to do stuff that you don't want to like, and I, that, that just kind of stuck with me. It was like, well, you know, if these guys that I looked up to did this stuff, then why can't I? So I just, I'm going to do it. You know, I've, I've also wrestled with a broken hand. Uh, I broke my hand in Australia. It like, I caught a dive weird and, it popped like right in the middle of my hand and I uh, went to the doctor and they're like, yeah, you're, it's broken. You got to get casted. But I was like, mm, what if I don't? And they're like, 
well, I don't know. So, and, and that's the thing is like, I, I kind of realized through all of this that it's like trial and error. It's like, just because the doctor says you have to do something doesn't mean you have to, it's probably recommended, but you might be okay. If you don't, uh, the reason I didn't get a cast on my hand though, was because I was doing MSG like three weeks later. I was like, well, I'm not going to miss that. So no. I had, I had like a, a hand splint that I just like taped up like crazy and my match at MSG, I had a broken hand. The the other thing I always like is uh, going to the emergency room with wrestlers and them having to describe what happened and doctors just giving you that <laughs> look like, excuse me. Like one yeah. time my, my husband was wrestling a match in the Indies and he took a chair shot wrong, sliced his head open. Uh, so we're in the ER and it's like, oh yeah, and I'm showing him like videos of the table spot and stuff. They're like, and you did this willingly? Like, yeah, like <laughs> yeah. 20 bucks. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. You want to see a skull? Cause it's literally good. Down. I'm like, That's... Oh my God. Or you, you go in with like a broken bone and like you're covered in blood. And they're like, well, what about the blood? And you're like, oh, no, no, the blood's like, fine. Oh, don't like, worry about that. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's not mine. Don't worry about it. And you're like, what? <laughs> it's like, I'm not sure whose it is, but it's there. Whatever. Yeah. I just kind of went through a table, did all this other shit. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Oh, Do my God. Do we need to call the police? Uh, is there is there a third party? Like, no. That needs to be no, we're good. Right. They, they always think like, are, are, are you safe at home? Like, yeah, no, this wasn't at home. This was at work. And then you're like, wait, this is a workplace injury? No, no, not like that. Not like that. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I want to talk your ba- talk about your band a little bit. Uh, you're the vocalist for God's Hate. Yep. Uh, you talked about, you know, your your love for music and, and your involvement with that. Uh, how it, Like knowing that your jaw was wired, wired shut and all this stuff, how do you keep your voice in shape to do you know, vocalist for a band like this, uh, what, what's the trick to not blowing out your voice? Because I yell at wrestlers a lot and I'm legitimately <laughs> interested in knowing the answer to this question. Well, Aubrey, I wouldn't say that I have the most angelic voice, uh, but I, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's all just very like guttural and low. So it's like singing from your stomach instead of your throat. Uh, I also do like vocal warm ups where I just do like a lot of like, humming or you like do z's like and like if it gets your like throat vibrating then it's probably better um but yeah it, so it, it's 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 definitely i don't know trial and error i guess like you know what works and what doesn't uh there's times where i'll be yelling and it'll like pitch it a little hard and i'm like oh, okay that wasn't good like let's not do that um but yeah, I, I would recommend some vocal warm ups. Maybe some breathing exercises would do you well. Uh, sometimes okay. some hot tea is a great Take suggestion. Notes. Yeah. <laughs> I got a whole I got a whole sheet of paper on that, Aubrey. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know why yeah. I haven't asked you. Yeah, I talk to you all the time. <laughs> Emory Emory Voice Center in Atlanta. Uh, oh, is well, tremendous. that would mean I have to go to Atlanta. So. There you go. You need to move to the East Coast again. Nope. So listen, uh, Brody, God's Hate is touring this summer, right? No, we don't tour. We oh, do, don't we tour? Play, we, no, we play. So we play like weekends here and there. Okay. So what, we just did. Um, we did a fest in Kentucky last weekend. Wow. Uh, and then we did. Uh, we're doing. We were supposed to go to Europe this summer, but I don't think that's going to happen because. Well, that's plane tickets are astronomically <laughs> expensive. And sure. also, right. you know, there's some weird stuff going on over in that area. Right. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, we like to do like, you know, regional stuff. So we'll do like three or three days in the Northeast. We'll do like New York, Boston and, you know, somewhere else. Or we'll do L.A., San Francisco and somewhere else. OK, hopefully I'm hoping by the end of the year we hit like Portland, Washington and like Vancouver or something like that. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's fun. Like it was never like the most serious thing. And I feel like because of that, it's become a lot more serious. Like we came out with a record, um, last March that it actually just said it's one year. Um, Congrats. that got a, thank you. That got a great reception and, uh, we've been doing really well and it's been really fun and, you know, kids enjoy it. And it's a, it's a good release. Like, to step away from wrestling for the weekend and like go be with my music friends and like people that I grew up with and, you know, get to hang out with them and, and just do complete something completely different. Um, 
I feel like it's it's more therapeutic for me, I guess. Love that. We're talking to Brody King on AEW Unrestricted and coming up, lots and lots of fan questions. This is AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey and Tony here with the amazing, wonderful Brody King, a member of the House of Black, one of our recent signees, AEW. Uh, I think one of the early times we worked together on the indies, there was a match with uh, Gummy Bears, Uses Tax, <laughs> and someone's groin went into a traffic cone. Uh, so there's, we're going to have to have a part two. Of this I, love, I love, I love Tony's face trying to decipher what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's the Indies, man. Yeah. It's like okay. anyone pours out gummy bears and then the whole crowd is like, no, ooh, ooh. like they, they, they just know they don't have to jump. Like, oh no, this is clearly tax. So there's also in someone's yeah, mouth. A hardcore match with Tommy dreamer where we sold yeah. gummy bears like thumbtacks. So <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, that's tremendous. <laughs> anyway. Enough about gummy bears' tax. Let's uh, let's get to the fan questions. I've got a question from Big Woody Style. If you could gonzo bomb any celebrity, who would it be? Jim Cornette. Next question. Oh, good answer. <laughs> Fuck that guy. So I'm going to I'm going to cut the line here, Brody. I'm going to cut the line at Tony Shimani twenty four wants to know. Every time I see you, I go, Jesus, look at those fucking tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I say that because I have like one here and one here, one on each shoulder. That's that's it. Those had to be. Did you plan that or did, did just did that just evolve? Because man, those are it, freaking amazing. They it are. Spreads, it spreads like a virus, Tony. Like I, I have no, like. I feel like I always had like a, a, a fascination with tattoos. Yeah. And then, you know, when I saw guys like the undertaker and like bam bam bigelow it's like I was like yeah those guys look cool so it was like yeah. it, it was always something in me when i was a kid i would like go to the store and look at like tattoo magazines and stuff so it was like sure. i always knew that i was going to be covered and at some point right um, i didn't realize how bad it hurts to get tattooed especially mm. like you know some spots yeah some you know, spots oh, hurt. god your right. ribs your back your stomach it's just yeah. it's the worst right. uh and it's funny because people are they're always like oh, you must have a crazy pain tolerance like no I absolutely hate getting tattooed. I just like the way it looks. Wow. <laughs> now that's, wow. It, it's like, and listen, uh, I've seen wrestlers getting with tattoos. Uh, you were the prize, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think that I think that I might be the most heavily tattooed wrestler. Yeah, you could be. Whoa. And you hate getting tattoos. Aubrey, back to you. <laughs> Oh, man. I, I look at you're like, oh, my God, getting tattooed on a ribs hurts. I legit fell asleep during my rib tattoo and the guy had That's to like psychotic. wake me up because I well, was twitching. I mean, here's the thing. People can say whatever they want. Women are tougher than men. And that's just the that's yeah. just the bottom line. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. I agree. I agree. And also because Aubrey's. I'm a tough son and we of love her for it. Yeah. 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 Aubrey, yeah. You, people, 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 you had people questioning the legitimacy of thumbtacks because you were unfazed <laughs> counting in a pile of thumbtacks. Right. Oh, I, right. I was phased. The camera was behind me, though. Like, so you okay. can really see my face. <laughs> like, well, that shit hurt. Let's be you did clear. A great, that you shit did a great job. hurt. Yeah. I just really yeah. care about my job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just an Aubrey thing here. And Aubrey, I want you to get back to the question after this comment. Okay. The comment is that, you know, how in wrestling we always hug each other, right? Everybody mm -hmm. sees each other on the hug. When I hug Aubrey, it's like she's giving me a freaking bear hug trying to break my back. I'm like, <laughs> shut thank up. you. Shut I up, you liar. You. Oh, you liar. Yeah. We finish hugging and you're like, you, you give the nicest hugs. So that's, <laughs> you're full of shit. No, but I, I, full of shit, I, Tony. I like firm hugs. You and Sonny King, the best huggers, it's like, mm. you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, anytime someone hugs Sunny Kiss, you end up getting like a chiropractic adjustment. <laughs> oh, man. Right, so. Yeah. They give great hugs, though. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you, oh. You're great. You're great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Back to the questions. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, Tony T asks on Twitter, who is your Mount Rushmore of metal lead singers? Oh, boy. Uh, this is such a hard question. Um I feel like it can it can go so many different ways. So I'm just going to kind of throw out a couple random ones. So I would say King Diamond is probably on there. 
I mean, he's got just an insane voice, insane reach. Um, Corpse Grinder from Cannibal Corpse. Uh, he has the most insane heavy voice ever. Uh, by Jamie Josta from Hatebreed. Um, and probably Ozzy, honestly. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. I know uh, who one of those are. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole different world, buddy. It really oh, is. Oh, it is. Yeah. Uh, here's one from a fellow metal vocalist. According to him, this is Kyle is all elite. As a fellow metal vocalist, what are some major similarities and differences about being uh, on tour with a band? I know you say don't tour, but being with a band and touring with wrestling. Uh, so, I mean, I've done my fair share of tours. We okay. just don't do that currently. But gotcha. uh, the, right. the, biggest, the biggest uh, difference is, you know, obviously with a band, you have to think about five or six people. With wrestling, you really have to think about just yourself. Um, also there, you know, depending on what size your band is, you know, th there's been plenty of tours where it was like, Hey, can we sleep on your floor? Like, can we sleep in your, you know, front yard or whatever? Uh, it, it's just like, you never know where you're going to sleep, but with wrestling, usually there's probably a hotel room. Uh, you know, depending on what level of wrestling you're at, there might be 10 people in the hotel room or just you. Right. <laughs> But uh, I would say that everything in wrestling is a little bit more um, handled than than it is touring wise. There's there's less uh, wild cards. Yeah, I think maybe just because you are thinking about yourself a lot in wrestling, it's a lot easier to ask for the things that you know you need, like talking to a promoter, like, "Hey, I need my own hotel room. I need my own flights. I need all these these things." And yeah, sure it's a lot harder when you're like, "Hey, these six people each need hotel rooms." It's like, yeah. <laughs> that ain't happening. Yeah. You get one and you get to Rochambeau for who's sleeping on the pullout couch. Like, yep. <laughs> awesome. We have a question from Evil Emo 94. What made you decide to be straight edge? Uh, so when I was 16, um, I found hardcore music and I, I drank a few times and like smoked weed a couple times and it just, they were just, it just wasn't for me. I didn't like the, uh, I didn't like not being in control, I guess. Um, and then I found out what straight edge was through, uh, hardcore. And that was like, okay, well, I guess that's what I'm going to do now. Like, I don't like doing drugs or drinking. It's not that I'm against anyone else doing them. It just wasn't for me. I had long lived Thunder Rosa wants to know, and you kind of touched on some of your uh, experiences with film and, and, and shows. Uh, what's the favorite film or show that you've ever worked on? Favorite show is probably RuPaul's Drag Race. Favorite okay. movie. Um, I don't know. They Probably like Angels and Demons or like Spider-Man because there's just like so many crazy like sets and scenes like i think it was right. spider-man 3 where they like have this giant like battle in the sewers and like we built that on stage and it's just like seeing all these insane uh you know sets being yeah. built and like what goes into it is is always really impressive um i worked on some some of them like the newer star trek stuff and like watching them like build the ships for that is insane right uh, pirates of the caribbean they they built two full size pirate ships and they were in like a airplane hangar and they had wow. them on get they had they had them on gimbals so they were able to like move like with the water and then you would see the stuntmen like swinging back and forth on the lines and stuff it was really wow. cool to watch yeah so it, it was always like the stuff that had like really big set pieces that like right. people were doing crazy stuff with right that's cool damn that's awesome uh we have another question from Wobius, Wobias, I don't know, whatever, these names. Uh, what's your favorite match from PWG? Hmm, probably, I think the one that I always kind of go back to, it's either me and Darby. Uh, I think that was the first time he had used a skateboard in a match. Lucky me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I also powerbombed him with a skateboard, so lucky him. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I also the I would say the other one is probably me and Tyler Bateman 
Violence Unlimited versus um, Walter and Timothy Thatcher. Oh, that was that was a that was a fun match, and that was like one of my first few matches there, and it was like very well received and and yeah, getting in the ring with guys like Tim and, and Walter is incredible. At Black Heart Gang wants to know: Do you have any weird hobbies or collections? Um, I collect taxidermy stuff when I find it. Like, I got really, a coyote here and a, a ram's head here. I got like a mummified bat and duck, and then I have like a antler, um, not antler, uh, pronghorn antelope as well. well. Uh, I wouldn't say I like heavily collect them, but like if yeah. I find them for a reasonable price, like. Uh, this coyote and the, the, the antelope head, um, came from the show big love, which was like a show on HBO. Right. And, oh, they, yeah. and usually at the end of like long series, they have like lot sales where they just like sell off everything that they'd bought in for the show. And they like, I was like, how much for the taxidermy heads? And they were like, what? Like you want that? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. And they're like, uh, Give me 10 bucks for both of them. I was like, oh my God, here you go. And it's what? like, it? if you go, if you go into like a store that sells taxidermy stuff, it's like hundreds of dollars. Like yeah. that would probably be like five or $600. Like the antelope head would probably be around the same. So it was like, wow. I couldn't get that $10 out of my wallet fast enough. Wow. Oh my God. Very have cool. you, have you ever been into taxidermy or are you just into collecting? Oh God, no, I don't, I don't want to hunt animals. <laughs> I don't want to kill anything or stuff it. Right. I just, I just like that it's kind of weird and creepy. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Oh, that is that is very weird and creepy. I respect it. As as a vegan, though, I, it's a little very creepy, but you know, <laughs> I respect it. Oh, we have a question from Mariner Stan. Uh, how did the I think you should leave guest spot happen? And was the promo scripted or do you have space to improvise? Do you have any fun stories from that experience? Uh, so that was very random. So my friend Madison, uh, he runs a company called Suburban Fight, which is like a no ring, yes. like bar wrestling type thing. Uh, me and Darby wrestled there a few times on it. And he reached out to me because I think one of the producers of the show maybe went to one of the shows and they, they reached out to him and he was like, hey, do you want to do, do you know that show? I think you should leave. And I think this was, shortly after the first season had come out and I was like, yeah, I love it. Like that type of humor is right up my alley. And he's like, well, they want to do this skit and they want to know they would, they need like a pro wrestler, like a big, scary pro wrestler. And I mentioned you, what do you want to do? And I was like, bill. yeah, absolutely. Uh, but then, you know, quarantine happened and that kind of just like went away. And I was like, Oh, well maybe it'll come back. And it was like, maybe late 2020 or early 2021 and uh jesus the thunder was just so loud it sounds like there's an earthquake in my house sorry yeah me too <laughs> yeah um but uh he shot a music video for this band and asked if the, i think you should leave guys were still interested in it if they wanted to piggyback on the um on the set because they had a wrestling ring in the music video as well okay. and they were like, yeah, sure, let's do it. And it was like uh, one of the writers, a producer, and a director came out. So Tim wasn't even there. Uh, I didn't really know what the scene was about. They kind of like gave me like a rough idea. They're like, you you ever see that gif of like Donald Trump like beating up the guy ringside and it has like the CNN logo like over his head? Yeah. Like that was like the idea. So it was going to be like there's a, a fake company called Calico Cut Pants and – if like you don't give to this company, then I'm going to come beat you up. And so the original, <laughs> the original idea was like me beating up a wrestler and there was going to be like a box over his head that said like calico cut pants or whatever. Um, but so we shot a bunch of stuff. I shot stuff with um, another wrestler that didn't get aired. And it was just mostly like, they're like, we just want you to yell a lot, like as much as you can. And they, they came, they gave me some lines but they're like, feel free to like make it you and like whatever works for you. And it's funny because they had me, they had me send them like some videos beforehand, like just seeing like how I did. 
and it was just me yelling at my phone and they're like it, you know i tried to do some like more pro wrestling stuff where it was like more macho man-esque or whatever and then there was like they were like can you just yell as hard and as loud as you can and it was just like me like in my car screaming at my phone and i like smoked my voice so it's mm, like they're like yeah it's great we want to film it on saturday and this was like monday i was like oh no it's like the next day i was like hey how you doing and it's like oh my god oh i really hope this comes back by saturday and it was like friday it still wasn't back and saturday morning it was like all right we're good and uh yeah i just did these lines and was just yelling my head off in the ring and then uh then it popped up the funny thing was is i was in like the the promo trailer for the for the show and because it was like in quarantine and i wasn't really seeing anybody i didn't really tell anyone either so it's like i completely forgot to tell my friends who love this show as well and they were like wait you were and i think you should leave why the fuck didn't you tell me i'm like oh sorry like i forgot <laughs> yeah but so you know I, I think it's funny now with when wrestlers i think like hangman the other day was like Dude, were you and I think you should leave? I'm like, yeah. And he's just like, that's awesome. But yeah. it's just like when they find out and they're like, yeah, I was just watching the show. And then you just popped up on my TV. I'm like, that's cool. Well, this whole experience has been cool. Uh, you are on my Mount Rushmore of tattoos. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Yeah, man. And and also, it's uh, we've been talking with Brody King. Brody, it's great to have you here. Good stuff, man. Glad you're here with us. And we're expecting good things from you and the House of Black moving forward. Thank you, buddy. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Avery. Okay. You can follow Brody King on Brody X King. That is on Instagram and Twitter. That's Brody X King. And how can you follow our podcast, Aubrey Edwards? You can follow this podcast, AEW Unrestricted, for free on all of your favorite podcast platforms. We have new episodes on Thursday. And if you want to see the terrifying taxidermy heads that Brody has behind him, you can watch the video version of this podcast, which typically come out on Mondays. And then speaking of Mondays, we come out on YouTube, which is the same day that we have Dark Elevation. We've got AEW Dark on Tuesday. We've got Dynamite on TBS on Wednesday. We've got Rampage on TNT on Friday. We're everywhere all the time. And you can see this terrifying man and all of his tattoos. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and for Aubrey Edwards and Brody King, I'm Tony Schiavone. Thanks for listening to AEW Unrestricted. Bye.